Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is Tri-Cities Community Television. I would just like to begin with um, a land acknowledgement to acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of Coquitlam First Nations. And we'd like to express our gratitude to the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and protect the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. This afternoon, I'm joined by Corporal Scott Klein of the Coquitlam RCMP's Mental Health Unit. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Scott. No problem. Thanks for having me. Well, can you start us off by telling us a little bit about the Mental Health Unit and what the role of the Mental Health Unit is and a little bit about who's involved? Yeah, for sure. Uh, mental health unit. Uh, I've been involved with the mental health unit uh, for about the last three years now and transitioned into this position. And it basically took it from a one person position. And now there's three of us. I'm in charge of the unit and there's two other fellows that I work with, uh, Constable Martin Hollibar and Constable Habib Shaw. And so the three of us work together and um, basically tackle everything that's mental health related. Um, within the Coquitlam RCMP. We try, we try and um, do as much as we can uh, to support the clients that we, we have in the Tri-Cities and uh, the partners that we work with there. Can you tell us a little bit about why it's important to have a mental health unit in um, the Tri-Cities? Yeah, we're basically um, trying to, to work with the established partners that we have in the Tri-Cities, um, some of the mental health teams that we have through the Fraser Health and um, Basically, um, just trying to support the clients that um, we deal with uh, from a policing perspective. Uh, there's a lot of clients that we deal with that um, really they have no criminality to them whatsoever. It's just simply mental health related issues that are, are causing the um, police to, be, to get involved with them. And so just trying to basically reduce those kind of contacts for people if we can connect them to the uh, appropriate um, Health, health authority or um, mental health teams that we have in the community and just trying to, you know, make it so they're not involved with the police and, uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the partners? You said that you work in partnership with Fraser Health Authority. Are there other partners that you work with and what would their role be? Yeah, mostly Fraser Health. We, we fall within the Fraser Health region. And um, we, we cover a variety of different age groups. Um, it can be, I've seen as young as like nine or 10 years old, um, up into like 110 years old. And for a variety of reasons in between, uh, we see that age group. We deal a lot of times with, um, Tri-Cities Mental Health is one of our biggest, um, for, the, for adults, that's who we, we tend to do referrals to. And then we also support the staff that work there. Um, they do go out in the community and uh, we would support them uh, for their safety, safety of the clients as well. Uh, another one that we deal with, uh, uh, work with is the Assertive Community Treatment and their acronym, all these things have acronyms. Um, ACT is their acronym and they're actually based out of New Westminster, um, but they service the Tri-City area. And so we do a lot of work with them. Um, with their staff, uh, there's the ACT team, there's a lot of different layers and, and what they offer to the clients that they deal with. And so we get involved by supporting, again, both the staff that are going out in the community and uh, the clients that they're serving. Uh, we also do stuff with, with the youth as well. And so basically the couple of organizations that we deal with in uh, fall within in Port Moody, uh, Tri-Cities Youth Mental Health is one of them. And um, it's, all, it's very similar to what the adult one is. It's just for a youth component. And then another agency we, we make referrals to is called START, um, S-E-A-R-T-T. -T. And I can never remember what the actual um, wording of it is, but it's short-term assessments and, it, and, it's, and it's geared towards, I believe, like six to 18-year-olds and, and their families as well. So. Well, it sounds like you have a pretty big, um, a lot on your plate and a, a lot, big range of things that you need to cover. Can you talk a little bit about, no, during COVID, we've heard so many times that it's been um, really hard on mental health and a uh, number of, um, in a number of different ways. Can you talk a little bit about, are you seeing those effects and as far as the work that you do, are there more mental health issues out there now? And are they, do they differ than what they did before? 
Well, when I started in this position, it's coming up to three years. That was, I started this position when COVID was already an active thing. So um, I can't really backtrack to, to what it was like beforehand, but during the COVID times, um, it was quite difficult. Like we couldn't um, do the, the monthly meetings and things we do with some of our other partners in person. We've, we've only actually recently just started doing um, in-person meetings um, the last month was the, the first time that I've been involved in some of these that that um, has been ongoing for since I've been in this position. If there was a difference in the type of issues you're seeing or in the um, number of issues you're seeing. Yeah, well, we've had to kind of adjust during the COVID time and basically we're just resorting to phone calls with people where in, in person visits with people. Um, are much more effective, I think, like building the relationships with the clients. Sometimes we'd phone them and um, they either maybe didn't believe it was the police or didn't want to talk on the phone. And so those uh, attempts to try and connect them with the mental health resources in the community basically didn't really work all that well. So it's it's much easier now being able to, you know, knock on somebody's door and go in there and talk to them. And and it just it's just a much more approachable way right now. So... I think, yeah, COVID was hard on everybody with Zoom and the isolation and, like you say, making it much more difficult to make that communication connection. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you're trained for all of this? Like, you're a, an RCMP officer, but then you also have additional training. Can you tell us a little bit about the training that um, prepares you for, for what you're dealing with now? Yeah, it's a little bit of a myth that, you know, we're trained differently than any of the other officers, honestly. Um, any general duty patrol officer that's out there right now, they they encounter a lot of the, these mental health calls for service and do an excellent job doing what they're doing. Um, we there, there really honestly isn't a ton of extra training that we get. It's just uh, time in. We have meetings with um, other mental health liaisons that work in other cities in the Lower Mainland, and that's part of the Zooms that we we would be involved with. So you learn different um, things during those meetings. Um, I, myself, and my partner Constable Shaw, we did uh, venture out and we did a program through Camosun College. And it was a one-year program that we we took upon ourselves to to complete. It was mental health, addictions, and basically the criminal justice system. So we we've done something like that to try and improve our skills and what we're doing and what we're offering to people. Well, thanks for clarifying that. I guess that was an assumption on my part was that you would have received some extra training, um, and you have had some that you've taken on yourself. So that. I think is helpful in dealing with um, the people that you meet. How do you deal with um, the trauma? Like you're exposed to a lot of tra traumatic situations and that takes a toll on our healthcare workers, on our frontline workers, on police. How do you deal with that? Do you receive any support in that area or is that something that you um, have found in other ways to deal with? Yeah, there's there's definitely an improvement in that area w with policing and and just being okay that there you know you may not be feeling well right now and it, and it's not because of it's a it's a uh, flu or something like that but you're you're suffering from from the effects of, you know mental health issues like everybody everybody's in the same boat basically where um, it can, you can be affected by this right so we try as a group the three of us when we work together like we we try and work on problems together and and come up with a, a solution to things so uh, one person's not basically um, left trying to work through a problem on their own and we try to do it at, like a team effort in in figuring these things out and well, it sounds good that you have some support from your colleagues there. So you said you're working as a team. Can you tell us a little bit about um, just a day in the life of the mental health um, unit officers? What what do you do on a day to day basis um, when you get a call? Can you walk us through kind of what happens and what the long term process is as well? Yeah. So basically the way that the mental health unit is set up is that we're not first responders to, um, to calls for service, basically for mental health related things. Um, if we are out on patrol doing, you know, we're not assigned something at the moment and a call comes in, then definitely we can assist. Um, you, generally the way it works is the patrol officers then would get assigned that call and 
we we could tag along and we can go in as a you know a supplemental officer showing up and helping out or sometimes if it's a, a known client that we've worked with we've try and build the rapport with the with the client and then hopefully if you know if it, if it does come to the person being in a crisis hopefully that bond that we've made with that person would you know be a benefit and and have basically the police involvement at, at the lowest level that that's needed really so it sounds like you um, establish a relationship and then you try to develop a long-term relationship with people that are vulnerable or who may be struggling. Do you ever get situations where uh, somebody feels that they're in a crisis um, situation and they contact you? Well, we try not to do that because uh, with just the three of us working, um, right now it's not really set up that way to, to, to make it to work that way. Um, I have had in the past where someone has called like directly to my like work cell number, and if I'm busy and and unable to attend, like that that then creates a, a time delay for that person. I basically would have to be like, okay, I think you should call nine one one and and have the officers that are in that area because we do cover you know the, the Tri Cities area here, so you know it could be a call that's on the far side of Port Coquitlam or something, and. Uh, I might not even be anywhere near Port Coquitlam at the time, right? So what we do is we try and encourage people to either call 911 if it's an emergency situation, especially if it's involve, involving weapons or violence, and the non-emergency number then. Um, if it's somewhere, you know, a lower scale than like a 911 call would be. And then my unit tends to then get involved after the fact, um, that's what we're, we're set up as a basically a support unit after the fact to try and, and build these relationships with the clients and and um, and work with them and get them connected, you know, wh whichever way they see fit. Really. Right. And um, no, I think that's interesting. I'm learning a lot here about how you operate. I think one of the things that we know is still happening is that there's a stigma associated with mental health and mental illness. Um, what does your unit do or how do you grapple with that, with the stigma around mental illness? Because it's not a crime, it's a health issue. In most cases, um, you know, when a policeman shows up, it's how do you try to sort of de-escalate or to be sensitive to that? Yeah, I think the three of us that are working in the unit, like we're very calm, quiet, you know, just we try and be be a help and not make things, you know, escalate situation. Um, the uniform that I'm actually wearing is, is different than the regular um, RCMP uniform. Uh, that came from the one of the ACT team leaders and she had put a request in because they the act team based is based in new west and they work with new west police quite a bit there and their uniform setup was quite different than what we our, our typical rcmp uniform so she had asked if i can put in some kind of a proposal to my bosses and and see if we can sort of make some alterations to, to the appearance just it's a bit of a softer look um, you know the gray pants there's no yellow stripe on them and just different color shirt and just trying to be <laughs> blend in a little bit better and and not stand out so much. Uh, the vehicles that we drive, um, they're fully unmarked vehicles. Okay. Yeah, and so you know the last thing somebody wants is you know a fully marked police car, lights on, and everything like that pulling up in front of their house. So like we could park somewhere and you probably wouldn't know that it's a police vehicle. And it offers the the person say we had to take them to the hospital. It offers them you know their own privacy as well because it's not you know, in, in the back of a police car driving to the hospital. Um, it's a bit more tinted windows and um, it just looks like a regular vehicle, right? So so a little more privacy and discretion. Um, when you are dealing with somebody in person, what what is the next step usually that happens? Are they sort of given some um, resources and supports or do they go to the hospital or does it depend on what the situation is? Yeah. Depends on the situation. I do a lot of the, the the file reviewing for the mental health calls that come in to the Coquitlam RCMP, and basically from there, I, I try and look at, at trends with people and seeing is there something going on with this person. Um, there's a lot of names that I know, and I and I know they're followed by mental health teams, and we really don't have to do much follow up with that person. But say for example, uh, an elderly person. Um, 
really has no police contacts in their past. And then all of a sudden there's like three or four police files for them, like over one weekend. And it could be for like kind of maybe odd hour things like midnight, they might be walking around a Quotland Center parking lot and then the police check them and take them home. And, and it could be another two days from that, another situation happens, but they're maybe on another street walking. And so that's when we would get involved. Like I would try and recognize that and say that something going on with this person, there's like a spike in their um, calls for police service and really can't explain it other than the fact that potentially this is a mental health related. And a lot of the stuff that we do though, we need to have the person's consent to that's that's critical like if we if we engage somebody and we talk to them and say you know we're, we're noticing this and then um, following up with you and if they say i don't really want to talk to you there's nothing that we can do um so basically but just trying to get their consent and their buy-in to recognizing that there's something going on and there are you know um people out there that can help right and i guess that's the first point is to just make contact and let them know that somebody's there and that there are resources that they can um, access if they need to. So um, I guess part of your work, it sounds like, is a little bit of um, putting together the pieces, like you're looking at those trends and those spikes and those clusters of situations that are out of character for somebody, um, and then following up on that. So it sounds you know, there's so many different aspects to what you do. It's like putting those pieces together and then the face-to-face -face dealing with the person. What makes you do this? Like, why did you why did you choose to go into this? It's a very, very challenging and interesting, rewarding, exhausting. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it what... covers all of those, for sure, definitely. Um, I, I just find that working in this unit and, and doing the work that I'm doing right now, uh, very rewarding, very good. I get good satisfaction in, in helping somebody that has had a lot of police contact and, and they're not in any way, um, would they be considered to be like any part of a criminal element or anything like that. It just so happens that they ended up dealing with the police for a number of different mental health things and finding that person and connecting them with the, the resources that are available and, and, and just getting that person the help they need. It sounds like you play a really important role in the community, making those connections and showing people that there's somebody out there that cares and that somebody is kind of watching over and, and making sure that everything is okay. Is there anything that you would like to say to people just to wrap up any words of um, encouragement if, if somebody saw somebody out there who they felt was, um, you know, endangered in any way? What would be their course of action? Would it be to call 911 and then to connect up with you? Yeah, like we, that's what we talked about earlier, definitely engaging the police through 911 or the non-emergency numbers is, is very important. Um, I'm not a call taker by, by trade or anything like that. Sometimes I wouldn't ask the right questions or, or get the right information um, if someone's calling me in a panic on, the, on my cell phone or on my office line. So I would encourage um, and they can always ask that afterwards if the mental health team can review it and, and see if there's something that they can they can get involved with after the fact, for sure. Um, it would be, you know, down the road, hopefully looking to, to be more active, like attending more active calls and stuff like that down the road. But for now, this is the way it's set up. And um, yeah, those two avenues, though, would be the best bet. And always be, if they ask the officers that attend, they can always ask that it gets flagged for a mental health follow-up. We get a lot of follow-up requests from officers that attend different um, situations. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much um, for meeting with us this afternoon and for sharing that. I really didn't have any idea what the mental health unit does or how you operate, so I think you've answered a lot of really good questions and given us some um, really good information. So I'd say thank you to Corporal Scott Klein for joining us this afternoon. This is Tri-Cities Community Television. Thank you.